to you to circumvent cytopathic hypoxia? And how can we take those therapies that are used in a compressed period of time and use them for anti-aging purposes, prevention of disease? And what they found was the reason the cells can't use oxygen because the inflammation disrupts energy production in a little tiny organelle called the mitochondria. The mitochondria is in our cell. If you look under the microscope, it looks like a little rod. And it produces energy. It's the furnace. And all cells to live have to produce energy. And you have high energy as a young cell and lower energy as an old cell as you get sick. Inflammation was disrupting the way we make energy. So food's brought from the body into the mitochondria and burned. It's called oxidized over something called the electron transport chain, almost like a factory. Okay, it's, it's an assembly line. And that was disrupted by this massive inflammation. And that's what happens when we age. Low-grade inflammation disrupts energy production in the mitochondria. So we came up with strategies to protect the mitochondria and to treat cytopathic hypoxia. And that's why I'm excited about this, because looking at what those treatments could be and will be, we're going to have tremendous strategies to stop this process of inflammation and aging. So aging is a universal, uniformly progressive, inflammatory disease that's always fatal. And our goal is to interrupt that progressive inflammation. One of the chief antioxidants in the body is called glutathione. It's the most abundant and it's the most important. When you're young, you have high levels of glutathione. When you're healthy, great levels of glutathione. And it's funny, it's just a tiny molecule. It's made up of three amino acids, so it's called a tripeptide. And so our body makes it, but sometimes our body gets overwhelmed with aging process or disease. Tremendous inflammation in things like, say, AIDS, all of those processes. We want to increase in glutathione. The problem is glutathione is a tripeptide. So if you take it orally, it gets broken down by your digestive tract. It's being digested. It becomes inactive. It can't be given intravenously because it has a, a strong charge on the outside of the molecule, and it can't pass through the cell plasma membrane. And so we're looking for ways of boosting glutathione in the body in the emergency room, and there's some precursors we can use, like alpha-lipoic acid, others called N-acetylcysteine. But I've been working with a new one, and that new one is actually called acyl glutathione. Acyl glutathione is a glutathione molecule, and we attach palm oil to it, palmitic acid. That's exactly what I did way back when with vitamin C ester. We took vitamin C ester, which was an acid, couldn't pass through the cells, and attached palm oil. So it's kind of repeat, history is repeating itself. But when we do this, acylglutathione could get into the cell, get into the mitochondria, and become active, and turn off the inflammation, and actually treat cytopathic hypoxia, whether it's from sepsis in the ICU, or whether it's from the aging process or anything else that we're working on. S-acylglutathione can also be used topically because with the palmitic acid or the fatty acid group attached, it can now penetrate the skin. And in addition to penetrating the skin, penetrate the cell and bring up energy levels in your skin cells. When that happens, cells like fibroblasts begin upregulating collagen and elastin production and can eliminate waste and bring in nutrients. And the skin becomes absolutely radiant very quickly using topical acylglutathione. So this is going to be one of the regimens you're going to see in the emergency room when we're treating cytopathic hypoxia or the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome or septic shock. So as you can see, we have got to protect the mitochondria, whether it's in sepsis or aging. And so glutathione and acylglutathione are wonderful developments as we look for protective agents. I've come across another one that's extremely exciting. And it's another peptide. And peptides are pieces of proteins. And uh, it's called the Zito-Schiller peptide. And these are amazing because these little strings of amino acids can get into the mitochondria. Now, that's important because a lot of antioxidants can't really get into the mitochondria in an effective way. CoQ10 can and alpha-lipoic acid can. But m many of the others don't work that well. Even glutathione has to go from the inside of the cell into the mitochondrial membrane. The Zito-Schiller proteins can get into the mitochondria and concentrate there a thousand times higher than in the cytoplasm of the cell, giving tremendous protection to the mitochondria. So you'll be looking forward to Zito-Schiller proteins as a therapeutic tool that's going to be used in many disease processes, and it's very exciting. There's something as simple as N-acetylcysteine, which is um, cysteine is an amino acid, but they put an acetyl group on it. And it changes the character because it allows it to pass through the mitochondrial membrane. 
And F-acetylcysteine is very protective because it actually is one of the three amino acids that make up glutathione. And so it's a, by giving a precursor, N-acetylcysteine with alpha-lipoic acid, we can elevate levels of glutathione. And just to show you how powerful N-acetylcysteine is, as when I was a uh, intern in pediatrics uh, right on this campus, uh, one of the problems we had is the young children would get into Tylenol bottles and eat Tylenol. Always intrigued me why they did that. They don't taste very good. Mm -hmm. And they were very sick because what Tylenol would do, acetaminophen, it would be metabolized by the liver and cause tremendous burst of free radicals and actually give them liver failure, and these children will die. We found is that if you gave them N-acetylcysteine, it would scoop up those free radicals, prevent the inflammatory response, and save them. And so we used N-acetylcysteine in pediatrics as a mist for children with respiratory problems because it thins mucus, but it smells like rotten eggs. So these children were given a glass, and they had to drink it. And I can tell you that it not only saved their lives, but they never went to a Tylenol again. <laughs> the whole room stunk like rotten eggs, and they had to drink it. <laughs> At the end of this segment one, I would really like to emphasize three things I want you to take away from this lecture. Number one, that inflammation is at the basis of aging and age-related disease. Low grade, can't see it, can't feel it, subclinical inflammation. Number two, inflammation is primarily created by eating the wrong food. There are other things that cause inflammation, ultraviolet radiation, stress, too much alcohol, smoking, but the main thing we do most of the time is eat. And the third thing I want to take away from you is remember acyl glutathione because that palmitic acid attached to glutathione allows it to become a therapeutic agent both given systemically and used topically. I think it's the glutathione of the future. When we come back for segment two, I will tell you about the science of nutrigenomics, which I mentioned briefly. Remember, that's beyond the antioxidants. And I will tell you about how we can turn on genes that function, function to protect our cells and turn off the bad genes, and how we can now go beyond antioxidants using the old, new, Superfoods. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Welcome back to segment two. And as I promised you in the first segment, we're going to be talking about a new term today called nutrigenomics. Through nutrigenomics and understanding that information, it will change our lives more than ever before. Now, I said initially that nutrigenomics is basically the study of the influence of nutrients and food on gene expression. Well, why is that important? What does that do? Well, let's look at a number of scenarios because I have to give you a little background before we get into the nitty gritty. You know, our body is incredible because it has sensors everywhere. We have in our skin pressure sensors, hot and cold, pain, and there are sensors inside the cell as well. And uh, these sensors are unique because they're molecular sensors. I mean, they're very, very tiny submicroscopic. And these sensors looking inside the cell for any changes that may be a detriment to the cell survival. And these sensors are essentially transcription factors. Remember, transcription factors are nothing more than messengers. They're protein messengers. When activated, will go to the nucleus of the cell, attached to a particular portion of the gene, and either express it or suppress it. There are three transcription factors I want to talk about today, but let's look at a little bit closer. Let's grind down a little bit more about how a sensor works. These sensors actually have a couple of sulfur molecules sticking up, and they're called thiols. And they will sense free radicals or oxidative stress. Now, oxidative stress is nothing more than when the free radicals so overwhelm the endogenous antioxidant system in the cell that the cell becomes overwhelmed and becomes oxidative stress. So these sensors are very important because then they will instruct the cell on what's happening. Now, there are, two, there are two bad guys, as I said before, as far as transcription agents. And one is NF-kappa B, and the other is AP1. So the question I always get is, well, why do we have these transcription factors that upregulate things that are bad? Well, they're part of the, our innate immune system because we had to have a way of dealing with invasion of organisms and so inflammation was one way of dealing with it. The problem is, as we age, or if we're very sick, this inflammatory mechanism gets away from us, as it did in the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or septic shock, and we're overwhelmed with inflammation. And so we have a dysfunction of the immune system progressively as we get older. So we have these two transcription factors, and NF-kappa B 
when it is upregulated by oxidative stress, the little sensors know the free radicals are there, it kicks off of what we call an inhibitory unit that keeps it from moving around and is now free to go to the nucleus and attach to a gene and express. And expresses over 100 pro-inflammatory chemicals. Now think about that on a cellular level if there are billions of cells, what that can mean and why we can lose organ systems like we do uh, in uh, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome.